so uh, we've, we've covered a few things. We covered um, you know, what is blockchain. We talked about some of the components. We talked about distributed ledgers. We talked about ways validations take place for validating transactions that get added to the block. We talked about the difference between private and public uh, blockchains. Um, uh, now we're, I'm going to get into some additional use cases. These are live applications that, that are leveraging blockchain technology today. And you'll see there's a huge diversity of potential uses for, for blockchain. So this is a very popular uh, blockchain-enabled application called OpenBazaar. OpenBazaar is a blockchain-enabled uh, e-commerce site. So if you were going to compare it to a non-blockchain company, the, the best uh, comparison might be Amazon. So it's an Amazon that uses blockchain. Now remember, a blockchain, there's no centralized marketplace or exchange. This is peer-to-peer. -peer. So every participant, or anyone who wants to open a store or wants to buy something on OpenBazaar, downloads the Open Bazaar software onto their laptop. And once you do that, you can open a store, you can put merchandise in it, you can buy merchandise in, in other stores within within Open Bazaar. And this is all provided at, at no cost. There's no trans there are no transaction fees um, and all all peer to peer. Um, so and it so it's it, it's it's a, it's a very interesting model. Um, any one of you can, can sign up for this and, and, and download it. Um, so that's Open, open Bazaar, that's an e-commerce uh, application. May I ask one question? So Please. you can, the, and which currency is used? I, th I believe they accept several different digital currencies. Okay. So yeah. cryptocurrency, uh, uh, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, uh, there, there are five or six currencies, I believe, they, they accept. They didn't create their own currency. They use other currency. I don't believe they have their own currency, but okay. they, they could do that, yes. Okay. okay. Any other questions about Open, open Bazaar? So when, you, so when you participate in uh, Open Bazaar, you, you, you have the whole ledger of transactions on your computer? The whole uh, blockchain of that application? Yes. Yeah. Every every from the beginning. Everything. You have everything from the beginning. From the beginning. Wow. Yes. It's only Bitcoin. We just checked on the internet. It's only Bitcoin. It's only Bitcoin that's supported. It's saying Bitcoin. Yeah. It uh, okay. just says it on the website. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Thank yeah. you. So it's uh, uh, the cryptocurrency they accept is Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin uh, only, I guess. Uh, Amazon-like marketplace on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Um, if your flight was delayed um, getting here, if you came in from someplace else in the world, uh, you, you'll like this other application. It's an insurance application, flight insurance. If your flight is delayed, you get paid. Um, you take out the policy, and um, the more the more you you pay for the premium the more the potential reward. Every single flight has a different payout, depending on what its on-time performance has been for the previous three months. So they get all of the previous three months, uh, and then they calculate the probability that the flight will be delayed, and by how much, and you, you decide how much you wanna pay for the potential reward in case your flight gets delayed, you know, 15 minutes to one hour, one hour to five minutes, five hours, five hours to seven hours. The longer the delay, the higher the, the higher the payout. So it's an luxury really more than an insurance. <laughs> it's, it's in, a, in a lot of ways, it's really, it's a more a gaming gambling application than it is. But can we also go into that just as an example and see, okay, how much do they, because it's based on their performance, right? You said last three months performance on, so if I want to fly, let's say, to Copenhagen, to Brussels, I can go in there and see yeah. what's the insurance by British Airways, uh, Brussels Air, the, SAS, uh, yes. and of course when I see the one that has the highest insurance, yeah. that's the one that I'm... You can put the city pass on time. 
You put the city pair in there. Or you want to make money and you take the And it will, it will give you the payout. It will show you all the flights and all the airlines but for that city pair. And yes, it will. You, the ones that have the highest, uh, the highest uh, payout are the ones that are typically on time. The ones that have the lowest payout are the most reliable. It would be interesting to see if you could apply this sort of thing to the container ocean going shipping industry as kind of a way to hedge um, delivery yeah. of delivery of goods, right? If your goods are on time, you, you get nothing. But if you the more you put in and the later your shipment of your goods are, the more you get paid. It's kind of a it would be kind of a hedge, right? Interesting. Um, then there's a uh, ripple. I, I think I'm. I have a question to this. To my understanding, this business this idea could also be done with current technologies. Where I see advantage to use blockchain as a yeah. back end or storage. This this is on blockchain today, but it's it's not a live application. You all the data is in there. You can you can go play with it. But um, there are obviously some regulatory things associated with doing this because it's it's really a gaming gambling application. You're you're placing a bet against the probability and for a potential reward. And even if it's insurance, of course, insurance is highly regulated, and it's a different kind of insurance because it's there's there's. Um, there's no centralized platform. Do you, 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 you actually have to be on the flight to play against it? Uh, I'm sorry, maybe not. you have to have to take the plane to, uh, to take the insurance. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> <one. laughs> Do you? You could put virtual So this, this is not a, it's a, it's a demo <laughs> application right now. I understand yeah, that it's a demo on some old flight, but yeah, why should I money. use for this kind of nice Gambling application, a blockchain. What is the advantage to the blockchain in yeah. In, yeah. in contrast to a um, current database model? Well, uh, it's it's completely, completely for one, it's completely yeah. anonymous. And so when you when you buy this flight insurance, um, when you place your bet on that flight, they don't they don't ask you for your your name, your address any of that because and of course you're using crypto cryptocurrency to, to pay it doesn't also doesn't require has complete anonymity so uh your identity is is not is not real. you don't need to share a credit card a bank account they don't need to send it to your your bank or they don't need to know who you are Completely but, you, but you have the identifier, uh, your 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 number uh, by your sorry. your public yeah. by your right. public key. That's how yeah. they would you know who you are. Key right. identifier. Does everybody understand that the public key is is your address, right? So it's it, everybody can see the public key. Nobody knows what your private key is. Um, you you use your private key for approving things, uh, paying for things. Etc. But the the other party doesn't doesn't actually see your private key. That's you keep that secret. Um, and I think can I add just can I add something? Like there's lots of people out there who doesn't consider this uh, connection with the public key that they actually need to pay very much attention to it or you know put it in an external USB hard disk uh, hard drive you know put it in the vault or you know bury it in the ground, wherever, you know, just to be extra secure on it, because the moment that you you can't access, I mean, you have yeah. lost that thing, yeah? Uh, and on the asset exchanges, it is really even more, because you have the, pa you know, you have password and the key, and you need both mm -hmm. to actually access. So if you lose either one of them, yes. and uh, with decentralized asset exchanges, you don't have that extra help from somebody at the nobody to go to like the centralized exchanges mm -hmm. where it says, Well, you know, you have all my details, so you must be able to find a way for me to recover access to my account. No, on the asset exchanges, like on the Bitcoin, if you have your own wallet, you throw that away, yeah. you don't have access. On the asset exchanges, the same. You throw away your key, you basically have no way of accessing and not and yeah, nobody. Nobody. Not your mother, not, you know, nobody can help you, yeah? yeah. And uh, so it's very important to, mm -hmm. to actually um, 
reserve that somewhere. And I, I, I have it on my own. I, I really have two different places that I don't tell anybody as such but who's holding it. We go have to go look <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're holding it, but, uh, but they, they actually only say anything at the moment something should happen. Yeah. And there's a there are, there's a series of uh, I guess they call it a suedo uh, password, which which is a series of words, maybe nine, ten, yeah, twelve, brain key, a twelve words that you you can, you use. can use. You don't have to write down or remember your your actual cryptographic key, which is a long string of random numbers. You you'd have a series of words that you type to get in your to recover your your private key on your your wallet if you don't remember what it is and certainly don't want to have to type it in. They call it a seed phrase or master key or brain key, you know, all of this. But it you you need to take both, yeah? I mean if you don't have the other if you don't have the brain key, of course you are kind of And and most of the wallets provide the ability to back up your back up mm -hmm. your key to keep it at a at a, uh, another to store it. Um, okay, no, but you all well, you do need to remember <laughs> under those words. In order to get it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then there's. Um, remember them. If you don't trust the order, you can get it. The next one to the right is is Ripple. That's the one we one we saw the press release about before. So this is this is money transfer, wire transfer, international wire transfer in minutes instead of three days with fees not 25 30 40 dollar fees but five six seven small uh very small fees so this solves a very real problem for for people who want to repatriate money back back home um, people who sell send uh, wire transfers in the course of business on a, on a regular basis it's much faster much cheaper, and this this is actually getting very rapidly adopted and, and used. Um, uh, you, you, ubiquity is for real estate associated uh, records, like land records, mortgages, um, escrow, anything related to to real estate can be can be stored and secured on their their blockchain. Um, and the way, the way a land record would work, and this is a very big problem in developing countries. You, uh, governments are changing all the time. You know, records are kept in filing cabinets on, on paper. Um, people will forge documents and you get two people saying they own the same plot of land. And economic development is a very, uh, land ownership is a, is a key, uh, uh, requirement, the foundation of economic development. Mm -hmm. If you can't be assured that you own the land, you're not going to build something there. You're not going to invest in in developing that land in, in, in any way. So with, with blockchain, it can put the land records uh, into them permanently in an immutable way on, on uh, the blockchain, multiple copies, um, and, and they're secure. They can never be changed, but they can be modified by subsequent uh, transactions. So for example, if a land record says that I own this particular land, if later I sell this land to someone else, there'll just be a new record that says, this land, here's, here's the owner. So it's been transferred. And this is something that I kind of skipped over when we talked about blockchain technology called smart contracts. Right? A smart contract can execute these kinds of things automatically when certain conditions are, are met. So for example, in the case of, of, of this application, the flight insurance, um, they have a feed of the actual landing times of the flights and whether they land on time. So if my flight is late by three hours and I was to be paid $75 at the flight is late three hours, um, the smart contract automatically and immediately transfers that money to me and it's irreversible. So those kinds of terms, when, when you hear smart contracts, some people think every single term in a contract has to be automated, which would be quite difficult, but there are, are some terms in contracts that can be 
put written into code and put in the chain. So the blocks that we were talking about before, sometimes contain records, sometimes they contain actual programs. Contract terms, smart contracts that will automate, automatically execute when certain conditions are, are met. Any, any questions about smart contracts? It's a really important benefit of, of, uh, of blockchain. <clears throat> Maybe it's a stupid question, but is there a limit in the size of a record in the blockchain? Or what, what, can, what can, I, can I put a, a DVD? In, there in there are limits to the size of the uh, of the data that you can put yeah. in a because the, in a block. Well, and you have to care to be careful with the performances too, because it, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, generally, you're not going to put like a movie, a full length motion picture, the the file. It's the movie itself uh -huh. in in the blockchain. You're going to put a a pointer of some kind to a database where they would where they could actually download the movie. Um, but they need to find the movie, they need to transact with the movie, they need to buy something of value. Music would be a very good example, right? So musicians are able on blockchain, all right, and put that application up here, are able to publish their, their own music and through smart contracts, whenever the movie is downloaded or streamed, receive the payment for the movie directly without any iTunes in the middle, without <laughs> any other third party. The musicians, of course, today they get crumbs, they get the royalty payment, right? After the movie producers and the record company and the distributor and iTunes, they all get paid and then there's this little crumb that's thrown to the musician. With blockchain, they can, just like an open bazaar here, they can they can sell their their own music and get paid publish their own music get paid directly uh, for the music collect the royalties some the, the full value of the music themselves mm -hmm. uh, and that can happen all automatically through the execution of a smart contract it was downloaded the contract says when somebody downloads this music or streams this music there's a payment that goes from that that person okay. to the musician. Um, other types of smart contracts might be when, when payment is due on something. Let's say your mortgage is a uh, smart contract for your mortgage payments, for example, with, or was on the blockchain. When you make that last payment, the title could be automatically transferred to you. Uh, or, or any kind of, of purchase. Let's say you make a down payment on something. And um, depending on what the contract says, either you're gonna forfeit that down payment or the seller is gonna get to keep that down payment because you, you didn't go forward with the, with the transaction. That can be put in code, put in a block in the blockchain and automatically execute if the payment, the additional payment doesn't show up on a specified date. You know, uh, stock futures. Uh, might be another example. So you buy a stock future and you're, you're, you're borrowing somebody's shares and you have the right to sell it on a particular date at a fixed price. On, when that date hits, you can exercise and get paid what you're, you're owed auto automatically and the shares get returned to the original owner. All of that can happen automatically through, through smart contracts. So there will there will be there will be coders working with attorneys to 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 put contract terms in in code and put them in blocks in the blockchain, and there there will increasingly be standardized um, uh, terms that will be already be coded for you that you'll be able to put in a block that will that will execute. Obviously, you have to put the specifics of your your particular agreement uh, in there as well. But um, uh, here's a wave. Um, this is this is one that uh, Intro will relate to. Uh, uh, they they are a blockchain company that that tracks cargo containers um, on the on the blockchain. Um, and health records, uh, blockchain for health research, is is the application to the. Uh, on the bottom right, 
I, I recently read a white paper. There's a, uh, a concept called MedRec. And in, I'll just use the US as the example because it's the one I'm familiar with. You know, I go to the doctor and the doctor has a portal that's run by a third party and it has all the information about every time I visit the doctor, uh, what the issue was, what the treatment was, uh, what, what he prescribed, what medications were prescribed. Um, and that's, that's an island of information on that, that portal that, that only my doctor has access to. Then I go to the hospital for something and they have their own database. I get sent to a specialist and the specialist has his own database. Um, and they don't talk to each other and the, the hospital can't see what medications am I taking right now um, or uh, have I been sick? What are my symptoms, reported symptoms the last time I went to the doctor? So what, what MedRec proposes is a way using, using blockchain, a way to enable permissioned sharing of that information. If I give the hospital permission using my private key to receive particular information that would be useful to them from my doctor's database. The, and this is a, 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 another capability that blockchain has, it's going to be integration, integration of disparate private databases. Notice that doctor, the data about me is not in the blockchain itself. It just, it just knows I, I may, I, you know, this is, this is Ken. This is, this is where his records are for his doctor. This is where there are some records for him at the hospital. There are some records here. And I could go in and, and initiate permission for the exchange of information, or, um, release to one party, sharing of, of information between parties. Um, a query goes to these ex, uh, external databases to, 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 to give the permission to pull the data back to aggregate data and provide it to the party that was permission to see it. <laughs> Too late, comment. Very good. Okay. Too late, comment. So that's it. So that that integration is an interesting aspect of of, of health records. And the there's also the the concept of that this MedRec white paper was suggesting. So you have to have a way to validate records, right? And you may may not want to use the Bitcoin method for doing this, uh, but there has to be some kind of reward for whatever party is providing the computer pe computing power to, to validate records. So who would that be for medical records? Who's going to contribute the computing power? Well, there's a currency in the information, the medical information that's, that's being collected when you go to the doctor, when you go to the hospital, when you go to a specialist, um, companies doing medical research would find that information very, very useful. They don't need to know that it's Ken Hansen that went to the doctor and had this diagnosis and received this treatment and had this outcome. Um, he was this age and uh, you know, all the information related to me about my medical care. So their proposal is that medical research companies provide the computing power and that their reward be anonymized medical research uh, data that they can use to develop new drugs, develop optimized treatments um, to improve health care. So that's uh, the blockchain uh, for, for health research. And these were just a few examples that I just gave you now, but here are some more. And I, I actually left out an important one. Uh, the Internet of Things is, is potentially something that gets integrated with, with blockchain. Um, but here you see some of these we've talked about, of course, cryptocurrency. But how about diplomas or certifications? Um, people, unfortunately, lie all the time about what degree they got at what university. I'm um, a PhD or I have a master's degree and later it's found out if there was no check, they really didn't have that certification or that, that diploma. You could put every bachelor's degree, every master's degree, every PhD on a, on a blockchain 
validated by the institutions that, or actually entered into the blockchain by the institutions that issued those credentials. And you would give the prospective employer, for example, permission to look at that certified uh, master's degree or PhD. Another example of is uh, great use for blockchain of birth certificates. In the U.S., there are 4,000 entities that issue birth certificates. These are towns um, as opposed to, it's not done at the federal level, 4,000. They use over 6,000 different forms for issuing these, these birth certificates. Um, think about, uh, and I heard an F, a person from the FBI describing why that's such a huge uh, vulnerability. Um, the bad guys look for people who, who died and that there's about the age of the person they would be if they were still alive, about the age of the person, of, of themselves, for example, and they, they will get a copy of that birth certificate or they will forge a copy of that birth certificate and they'll go to the motor vehicle with that and they'll get a driver's license. Now they have a driver's license. They get a passport. Now they can go anywhere in the world under somebody else's identity, do bad things, and then disappear completely. So if you had every birth certificate and every death certificate on, on the blockchain, you would, you would be able to authenticate whether that person is still alive or not. Right? And it, it, would be, it would be a database, although still distributed, um, and still entered by all those 4,000 parties, everybody can look at it. And with permission, um, they, can, they can get a validated copy. So that motor vehicle can check, is this a person that's still alive? Okay. Um, we talk about wire transfers, notary publics, without the notary actually being there, get something notarized. Uh, shipping and logistics, we talked about a little bit. Voting, e-government. Some companies, publicly traded companies, of course, uh, have shareholder votes all the, all the time. And already companies are starting to use this for, instead of sending you that, that thick proxy document at home that says, this is how many shares you have. Uh, we can vote them for you if, if you like, if you let us do that. Or you can come to the shareholder meeting or just, just send this in with your, your vote. They're actually doing those kinds of votes on a, on a blockchain. Um, I won't go through all these, but you can see there are quite a few, but I will touch on Internet of Things. So there are these, these, these uh, sensors and other Internet of Things collecting, collecting data all over the world. Um, some of them are collecting data, some of them are just connected devices of various kinds, like baby monitors, for example. And um, they, they're collect, some of them are collecting information that um, other entities may want access to. So one of the uses for, one of the places that intersects for Internet of Things and, and blockchain is you could set up a scenario where the data from the things is getting input into the blockchain and then potentially gets, gets shared on a permission basis with other entities. Things sharing data with other things, for example, because that other thing needs the data to execute what, what, what it does. Um, I, think, I think I'll just leave that uh, here, but you see quite a few other applications here. Any, any other applications someone wants to contribute that they've heard about or read or any questions about these? And the question is always, why, why is it better on the blockchain? I mean, some of these things you could do in a, in a centralized database. And so looking at the application, because um, blockchain, people who get enthusiastic about blockchain, like myself, we tend to see everything we see, oh, that could be solved with blockchain, that could be solved. There are some things that are better solved with blockchain than, than traditional technology. And usually, it's, there are applications where there, there are more than one party involved with this, a, a transaction that has counterparties involved, they, who, who are, uh, 
who don't know each other, who, who don't trust each other. Um, it's the blockchain that enables them to provide, to, to execute uh, a transaction, a transfer of value with, without having to have that, that uh, existing relationship in place. Any any ideas, questions, comments? Uh, sorry, I came late. And for part of uh, the answer to my question, I already have uh, been done in the first session. So, uh, um, one of the criticisms related to conventional authentication is that uh, it wants too much data, too much personal data. It compromises on the person's privacy. For example, if you say that, uh, uh, give me your passport, give me your fingerprints, then I'll know who you are, I'll authenticate you. So there is a lot of compromise in uh, uh, asking for uh, information to authenticate uh, a person or a transaction. In blockchain, uh, is there a balance between privacy and uh, um, like most yeah, things, the, the answer is it, it depends, right? So, I mean, does it place in, too in much some types of transactions or some types of blockchains, it's it's essential that that you provide certain information. Um, so, for instance, a, a, a banking uh, application, okay. interbank transfers. Each of the banks have to be authenticated and and onboarded, right? There may be other applications where individuals need to be authenticated to be onboarded. After that information is collected, they can then potentially be anonymous though, right? So they're, they provide the information, they're authenticated as holding, a, a, let's say, you know, you have to have a PhD to access something, uh, some, some special privilege, uh, you, uh, you, that's probably not the best example, but let's say you 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 an ent you become an entity after you're certified, and you can access certain applications, certain data, uh, you can transact in a certain way, um, but they don't have to know who you are. They just have to know that somebody took a look at all the proper credentials and verified them. But then once you're into the system, you can you can operate anonymously unless there's a legal activity or something like that there's a party holding the data and that may um, they may give that data up to law enforcement or if there's a court order or a subpoena of some of some kind a lot of these we there was a session earlier in the week at the ICANN meeting about uh, blockchain and data privacy there's still a lot of unanswered questions, regulations and policies that need to be addressed, right? Because here you have, uh, in some cases, you have a network with anonymous participants, um, a network that nobody owns, nobody is running, there's no centralized party holding data from anonymous participants. So, it, who do you issue the subpoena to? Who, who, who do you penalize and send to jail if something, if something goes wrong? There's, there's nobody. And in the context of ICANN, uh, what would blockchain do to uh, uh, minimize DNS abuse? Can the authentication that uh, blockchain talks about be used in, a, in the context of a top level domain name or a, a yeah. registrar or a registry uh, to uh, minimize uh, malicious sites and uh, uh, harmful. We're going to talk abuse. about domain names in DNS and potential uses of blockchain and in, uh, in domains in DNS in just a moment. There are some things already going on. Obviously, yeah. there are. There are uh, they're not top-level domains, but there are extensions, alternate root extensions, for example, and that are being sold. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Maybe if, if I don't answer your question, why don't you throw that back in? Let's see. So, next, next slide, actually. Uh, so, this diagram is, is, is something called Blockstack. This is the, the core architecture. 
and it's probably it's very hard to read from there, but but basically, Blockstack is for the Ethereum blockchain, and there's a .eth um, alternate route uh, uh, where you can you can register .eth. They accept registrations on an auction basis, by the way, uh, depending on how many characters the name is. But what these names are for is they, they're user-friendly names that resolve to public key addresses. If you want somebody to send you money or transfer something of value to you, you don't want to give them that long cryptographic string, right? Just like IP addresses are not very memorable. So um, there are domain names that are sold under .eth that I could give someone my Ken Hansen .eth name and they could transact with me without having to know my public key. The public key would be resolved from the domain. Mm. Also being issued, names are being issued for wallets. Say I have a wallet where I keep my bitcoins either on my phone or on my, my desktop. Um, I can get a name for that for that wallet, a user-friendly name instead of a public public key address. Right? And there's there's DNS because that resolution has to be done. You have to resolve the user-friendly name to the public key address. Is it given in a, in a text field? Then, this or? this hasn't been launched yet, but they're, they're they're planning on doing that. Test field. Yeah. It uses the text field. Yeah, it doesn't use any specific new mm -hmm. field that, that would you, be designed you know. by an RFC or something. You know. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. It, yeah, right. it's a text field that it uses. Dot TXT. Well, TXT. Yeah. Field. And there are there are other TLDs, alternate root TLDs being used in cryptocurrency too. There's a dot coin, <coughs> for example. Um, there there are a number of, of those out there. And then there's a there's so here's dot bit. Um, there is a .emc .onion for torrent torrent networks. Um, very often used in the dark matter for the transact on the.